It's a real pleasure for me to be speaking in St. Petersburg about the Fountainhead and Ayn Rand. Uh, she was born not far from here. She lived not far from here. So uh, it, it, it's quite I think, emotional and moving for somebody like me who's kind of grown up on Ayn Rand and being a fan and an advocate of her ideas for, I hate to say how long, you don't know how old I am, but you know, for 40 years, 41 years actually, exactly, um, to be to be here, to be in St. Petersburg and have an opportunity to talk to you. And particularly, I want to talk to you about today is about the Fountainhead. So I'm curious, how many of you have read Atlas Shrugged? All right. How many of you read the Fountainhead? Okay, a, a, a small number. So first, let me say, everybody should read both books. And those of you who read Out Shrugged should definitely read the Fountainhead, because I don't think you get the full richness of Ayn Rand's ideas and Ayn Rand's philosophy, and Ayn Rand's defense of freedom and liberty without reading the Fountainhead. Why is that? Now who is who here is for freedom? Who wants to be free? I want to see who doesn't raise their hand. <laughs> now the funny thing is if I ask that question in front of a group of leftists in America, every hand in the room would go up. If I ask the question in front of any group of conservatives, in the United States or in Europe, or my guess is maybe even in Russia, every hand would go up. There's not a person on the planet, almost, who doesn't say they're for freedom. Indeed, I would argue that freedom has kind of lost all meaning, because everybody's for freedom. Even as they try to oppress us, they claim to be doing it in the name of freedom. Liberty. Who's against liberty? Nobody. So I think it's really important for us to understand what we mean by freedom. What the term means to us. And when we talk about liberty and freedom, make sure we explain what it is we mean. And I think it is equally or even more important for us to understand the foundation. Why we are for freedom and liberty. Why we believe in these ideas. And why they are true, they are right, and they are objective. Not just because we feel like it. Not just, just because it's cool right now to be pro-liberty. But to understand why it is right. Why our side, the side of freedom, real freedom, is a site of truth. So what is freedom? What is freedom? Anybody want to take a shot? What's freedom? In English though, yeah. <laughs> but you have to yell. You just have to yell. Live for free. Free decisions. Free decisions. So you get to make your own decisions. It is just is it just about decisions that you make? It's about responsibility. It's about responsibilities, is it? Is freedom about responsibilities? Responsibility to whom? See, even in this group, we can't even decide, agree on what freedom is. Yeah? So it's to do what you want equally with other people. Equally? Really? So we all have the same equal opportunities? No. Legally, not equally. Okay, legally. So that's close. Freedom is a negative concept. All freedom means, all freedom means, is the absence of coercion. It's the absence of coercion. It's the absence of force. The absence of authority. The absence of somebody telling you what to do and have the power to force you to do it. It says nothing about what you should do. It says that others have no right to coerce you. 
Others should not be allowed to force you to do things you do not want to do. That's what freedom means. Because the left, when they say freedom, they talk about freedom to have opportunities. And therefore they say, you know, I don't know if you know the, the line that at least the Marxists use in, in the United States. They say, you can't be free on an empty stomach. Because you have no opportunities, because you're hungry. That is a perversion of the concept of freedom. Of course you can be free on an empty stomach. You can be free to go try and find a job in a free society. Freedom is not somebody something else provides to you. Freedom is the absence of something. It's the absence of force. The absence of coercion. And on that definition of freedom, almost nobody agrees. Because that definition of freedom is a radical definition of freedom. And it has radical implications about how we structure our lives socially. It means that the state cannot coerce. Because to the extent that it coerces, it violates our freedom. It means that coercion needs to be eliminated. Force, authority needs to be eliminated from every single aspect of our life. To be free means I get to make decisions for myself. Somebody said that here, right? And I get to act on those decisions. And nobody can stop me unless I am using coercion on somebody else. Unless I am violating somebody else's property rights or physical space. I am free when I can act on my own judgment in pursuit of my own values as an individual. So there is no such thing in a sense as freedom for a society <coughs> independent of the idea of freedom for an individual. Freedom rests on the idea that you, every one of you, as an individual, has a right to your own life, owns your own life, that the standard of value is your own well-being, and that you as an individual should be morally and politically left free to pursue your life. Again, left free means no coercion, no force, no authority dictating what you should do and what you should not. And indeed, this is the sense, the idea of freedom, the idea of a free society, rests on the idea of individualism. We will not have freedom. We will not achieve a society with no coercion unless we recognize the importance and sanctity of the individual and that the individual becomes the standard morally and politically. Particularly in the age in which we live in right now, an age, at least in the West, and you can tell me what's happening in Russia, but at least in the West, where we're seeing a rise of collectivism, a rise of tribalism, a rise of nationalism, and a decline in the respect and the importance and the significance and the sanctity of the individual in his life and his values and his choices. Particularly given those forces that are collectivizing today, that we thought, forces that I thought at least, had gone into the trash bin of history. It is so important today to not just fight for freedom, even if you've got the right definition. If you've got the wrong one, I'm not sure we're fighting for the same thing. But to fight for the individual. 
So what does that mean? And this is Ayn Rand, I think, great contribution to the debate. Rand is the defender of the idea of individualism. The idea that what matters in morality is not what is good for the group. Nobody knows what's good for the group because the group is just a bunch of individuals. There is no such thing as a group. It's just a bunch of individuals. What happens when we say we want to we want to fight for the good of the group? What always happens? Because we don't know what's good for the group. Who gets to decide what's good for the group? What's that? No one. No one? No, there's always somebody, right? Who gets to decide? Yeah, the leader, the, 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 the one who's willing to take charge, the one who's willing to say, I am special. Because I can communicate with the group. I have mystical powers. I know what the proletarian wants. Or I know what the Aryan race wants. Or I know what Russia wants. What the hell does Russia want? Russia doesn't know what it wants. You might know what you want. There's no, there's no Russian consciousness up here. There's no Russian mind. There's no Russian stomach. Russia doesn't eat. America doesn't eat. America doesn't think. I think, you think, you think, you think. You can't eat for me, and you can't think for me. So all that exists in the world are individuals. And what is it, I'm going to identify, what is it that is unique to human beings? What is it that makes it possible for individuals to live well, to succeed? actually even to survive, just to be alive. What is it that makes it possible for us as individuals to live and survive? What's uniquely human? What makes us human beings? Our mind. Our mind reason, that's good. Usually it takes the audience about 10 minutes to get to that. So you guys, you guys are way ahead of the curve. You know, you never heard that thumbs make us human? Thumbs? I don't know, Indian? In anthropology in America, everybody talks about thumbs as important. It's bizarre. What makes us human is reason. What makes us human is the ability to think. Every human value, every human value that we possess, from this building, the beautiful chandelier, to this uh, the technology we're using to light this, to screen this, to the whole world, is a product of one thing. It's a product of some individual, some ways, ability to think, ability to reason, and ability to create. But that creativity comes from his ability to think. It all starts with the ability to identify reality as it is, as an objective fact. To integrate new information into new ideas and new creations like the chandelier. Or like this microphone, or like the chairs that you're sitting on. Anybody here have the gene for hunting? We got one gene for hunting. I doubt it. Right? I doubt it. I don't think anybody has a gene for hunting. Because you try going out there from scratch, naked, running down a what's a big animal in Russia that you hunt? A deer. Chasing it, catching it, biting into it, killing it. You can't do it with your hands. You can't run it fast enough. So how do we catch deer? How do we hunt deer? With a gun. Yeah, and, how, and where did the gun come from? Somebody had to invent it. So even, even 10, 20,000 years ago, somebody had to create a bow and arrow. Somebody had to create weapons. Somebody created tools, somebody had to think of strategies, we as an animal cannot hunt without our minds. We cannot eat without our minds. We have to create and build agriculture. Nothing we do as a human beings can be divorced from our minds. No achievement can be divorced from thinking. So the most 
important thing that individuals possess. The most important thing that human beings possess is our capacity and ability to think, to reason, to figure stuff out, to be rational, to adhere to the facts of reality, and to build on those facts. Now, what is the, what is the enemy of thinking? What is the enemy of reason? What is the thing that would shut your mind down? Shut it down. Death. Well, death, yes, okay. Authority. Violence, authority, absolute. Force. Religion can be overcome. How many people here have overcome religion? I'm in the minority. Okay, few of us have. So it can be overcome. Using reason, by the way. That's the way to overcome it. But you can't overcome God unless you have a gun yourself. Somebody puts a gun to your head and says, this is what you must think. And if you don't, I pull the trigger. You're stuck. Two plus two equals five from now on. You can't build a bridge. You can't program a computer. You can't do much in life if you're under the assumption of a false dogma that is forced upon you. And if you don't adhere to it, you are going to be killed. Force. Authority is the enemy of reason. It is the enemy of human life because reason is our means to human life. When the first individual invented the bow and arrow, or agriculture, or pretty much anything in human history, what do you think we did to them? What's that? Shame them, you're moderate. You know, you're what do we do? Kill them. So yeah, we burned them, we burned them alive. We don't like people showing us off that they're smarter than us. In history, typically what we do with the great innovators, the great producers, is we shame them in modern societies, in friendly societies, and we burn them at the stake in not so friendly societies. It's only when we free the mind. It's only when we allow for intellectual freedom and then the freedom to act on that that we become prosperous, that we become wealthy, that we become rich and successful. If you look at human history from 100,000 years ago, most human beings lived on about less than $3 a day. I mean, even you guys I think, would struggle to live on less than $3 a day. Even in Russia. I think that's true. What is that in Uber? Three dollars a day. Some pathetic amount. Two hundred rubles a day? Something like that. For hundred years, that was what human race was. It was about here. This is the graph, right? It was. It went up a little bit. Human life got a little bit better during I don't know Greece and Rome, and then it went down through the Greek, you know, the, the Dark Ages. And it went up a little bit during the Renaissance, and and that's only in certain parts of the world. Most of the rest of the world was good poor. And then what happened? Something miraculous happened. Something miraculous happened. It went like that. I mean, I have to jump. I mean, it reaches almost the ceiling in terms of how better off life suddenly became. In particular, in the West, in Western Europe and the United States. Why? What happened that made this possible? Just yell it out. Stop with the hands. You're way too polite. Three yeah, the Industrial Revolution, but what's the Industrial Revolution a product of? Free, free minds! <laughs> She's got all the answers today. Uh, free minds. Suddenly, we liberated the human mind. We liberated the human mind from coercion. We liberated the human mind from superstition. We liberated the human mind from religion. And it went like that. Because what happened during that period? When, when did this happen? When did this go like this? When did that inflection point happen? Anybody have a date? What did you say? 1980s? 1900s. 1900s. Yeah, that's late. It happens before that. When does it happen? When does the Industrial Revolution happen? I like one year. I like a particular year. It's historically untrue what I'm going to tell you, but it's close enough, right? 
I like a particular year for the inflection point. I like 1776. Yeah, somebody else likes it. That's good. Three reasons why 1776 is a good year for human beings becoming suddenly freer and wealthier. The Declaration of Independence is written. Now, the Declaration of Independence is not just some document. I believe it is the most important political document ever written in human history. Because for the first time in human history, the first time in human history, a political document declared that every individual, every individual human being, has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That means that every individual human being is free to pursue the values necessary for their life, for their intellectual freedom, and for their happiness. Wow! You have a right to pursue happiness. To go out there and do what you think you think is necessary to achieve your happiness. Not what other people think. Not what some ancient book thinks. But what you think. The second thing that happened in 1776, a famous book was written in economics. Anybody know what that is? Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith was written in 1776. A third thing that was happening in 1776 was the first commercialization, commercial use of the steam engine, which then exploded into the Industrial Revolution. But 1776 is a culmination of a period that came before that. What do we call that period in history before 1776? Intellectual history. What do we call that period? It's called the Enlightenment. It's called the Age of Reason. And I'm sorry to give you a bunch of history, but it's important history. And you're not going to get it anywhere else, probably. Around 1700, people started suddenly, not suddenly, but they evolved to this point. They started advocating for using reason to discover the world. Newton does it in science. Locke does it in political philosophy. And they start saying, we don't rely on revelation. We don't rely on philosopher kings to tell us the truth. We don't rely on an ancient book to communicate ideas to us. What we rely is on our own senses and our own mind to discover the truth for ourselves. And hey, you've always wondered about motion of things. I'm Newton, and here's how we explain it, and it's pretty simple. And any one of you can understand Newton's laws of motion. And if you didn't do well in physics, it's not because it's hard. It's because you had a lousy teacher. Because it's easy. And people suddenly said, wait a minute. You mean I can understand all this stuff that's going on about here by myself? I don't have to rely on experts to tell me. I can actually learn it and understand it and figure out for me. Wow, if that's the case, then maybe, maybe, I can choose my own profession. And maybe, maybe, I can choose my own spouse, who to marry. Because until then, you couldn't. And maybe, and this is a big maybe, maybe, I can even choose my own political leaders and my own political opinions. And maybe I can be left free to pursue my own values and not be your slave. And that's the revolution. It's a revolution in the way people started thinking. They started thinking about their own lives, their own abilities, their own ability to construct their own life, to live their own life to choose their own values, and to pursue those values guided by reason. And we tried it, and this is what happened. Every country that adopts an attitude of individualism, every country that adopts an attitude that you are left to think for yourself, and you can act freely based on those thoughts, for the most part, I wish there was a country that did it 100%, but for the most part, we're allowing you to do that, we're leaving you alone to do that. We're extracting coercion. To the extent that that is done, people have thrived, succeeded, become wealthy, materially and spiritually. Ayn Rand, in spite of what you might have read, 
is not a materialist. The alternative in life is not between being a mystic and a materialist. Ayn Rand is not a mystic, and she's not a materialist. She believes in the spirit, in human consciousness, in human reason, which is not just pure material. So at the core of the idea of freedom, at the core of a free society, is the idea that every individual can and must, as an issue of personal responsibility, somebody said responsibility earlier, can and must live his life, live her life, as they see fit, that they have the tool that makes that possible. If you think about Plato's philosophy, Plato teaches us that we cannot take care of ourselves, that we are dependent on philosopher kings to guide us, because we live in a cave and only see shadows and never engage with real reality. Aristotle blows that out of the water and says, no, we do live in this world, and we do see this world, and the truth is accessible to everybody. Ayn Rand takes that idea even further. You, every one of you, can live your life by using reason, can take responsibility for your own life, if you choose to do so. You are capable of it. You're not dependent on authoritarians telling you what to do in order to live a good life. On the contrary, you cannot live a good life if you're living somebody else's life. The reason I want you to read The Fountainhead, and I really think everybody should read The Fountainhead, is it's, because an it's about an individual who chooses his own values objectively based on reality using his reason and fights the system of people trying both to coerce him, but just to argue with him, just to Im impose their authority on him. Not in the realm of politics, but in the fountain, it's in the realm of architecture. And it's not just him expressing himself however he feels. No, it's a book about the mind. It's a book about his reasons and his ability to show and to prove that he is right. And it's a book about the victory at the end of such a man. So I think to fully understand Ayn Rand's vision of individualism, what it means, why it's not subjectivism, why it's an objective view of individualism in the sense that it's guided by reason, not guided by emotion, it's the book to read. I also encourage you to read a non-fiction book, a book of essays of Ayn Rand, called The Virtue of Selfishness. That's a pretty radical title. The idea that morally, your moral responsibility is first and foremost, or not just first and foremost, your moral responsibility totally total is to yourself. It's to your own happiness. It's to your own success. It's to your own values. It's the living the best life you can live for you. Now, if you think about people who want to live their life for themselves, who want to pursue their values, who want to use their thoughts, their reason, to make their life the best life that it can be, to pursue whatever career they want, whatever romantic relationship they want, whatever, whatever they want. Then what kind of political system would people like that want? People who are confident, people who are assertive, people who are sure that they have a moral right to live a happy life for themselves on this planet. What kind of political system would a bunch of people like that want? Russia? What's that? Anarchy? No. I mean, I, I told, uh, I was interviewed by Mikhail yesterday for his podcast, I assume everybody knows who he is, or for his uh, YouTube channel. And I said that the first thing I would do if you, if you guys succeeded in establishing anarchy is I would leave. I believe anarchy is the worst of all political systems because it, it is the most violent. No, I don't think that's true. What they would want is freedom. And you can't have freedom in the anarchy. The 
but we can get into that if you want. Um, what they would want is a system where physical force, where coercion and authority had been eliminated from society. And I believe in order to do that, you have to have a government. A government that does one thing only, and that is eliminate coercion from society, protect the individual's right to life, liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness. So individuals with self-esteem, individuals who want to pursue their own values, individuals who trust their own minds, who know how to use their own reason, would never tolerate authoritarianism. Would never tolerate a government that tells them what to eat and what not to eat, who to marry, who not to marry, what profession to go into or not, not to go into, or even today, you know, what they can take in an airplane and whatnot. I don't know, one of the things that really pisses me off in America is to go through TSA security. I always imagine in my head George Washington, George Washington is a tall, you know, strong guy. I always imagine him walking through TSA and them stopping him and frisking him. He would beat them up. What the hell? Who the hell are you? A bunch of government bureaucrats frisking me. Don't touch me. But in the name of security, we now have. It's okay to touch. So, the key to freedom is to empower the individual. The key to freedom is to show the individual that they are capable of living for themselves. They are capable of thinking for themselves. They are capable of choosing the values for themselves. They are capable of succeeding for themselves. The key to freedom, to political freedom, is individuals with self-esteem and confidence to live their own life. The key to political freedom is ultimately a philosophy and morality of individualism, which means the idea that the individual is what is sacred. So, I truly believe that what we need in the world today is not a political revolution. We'll get to that. One day we'll need a political revolution. It's way too early for a political revolution. We're not going to win it, so why try? What we really need today is a moral revolution. What we really need today is a philosophical revolution. What we really need today is to build up an intellectual army of self-confident, self-assured people who want to live for themselves. And when the time comes, we'll be ready for that political revolution. Thank you all. У нас есть время задать вопрос. Поднимайте руку. Yeah, you can ask in English or Russian. If you ask in Russian, I'll get the translation. Меня зовут Ольга. Ну, я задам сразу вопрос. Я думаю, что Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's it's a question I get in almost every time I speak in front of young people, um, because uh, because uh, anarchy seems to have this amazing appeal, particularly in Europe, but also in America, on uh, on young people, and in particular on the libertarians. Um, anarchy is le legitimization of violence. It is the idea that violence, force, coercion is just one other thing that we have in human among human beings. We have bread. We have iPhones and we have violence. And the way we create bread, the way we create iPhones, is we trade, right? We have market institutions. And since violence is just like everything else, then we need to trade by violence, right? You have your police force, I have my police force, they have their police force. And we just engage in market activity to figure out what is right. Now that is the most scary thing I can think of. That's Somalia. You can all invite us to go to Somalia if you want to. Um, no, violence is not something you trade. Violence is not something you create a market for. Violence is anti-market. Violence is anti-trade. 
Violence is anti-reason. Violence is anti-human life. Violence is what you is what you eliminate in order to create a market. Violence is what you put separately. You create a monopoly over the use of retaliatory force to eliminate violence so that markets can arise. Indeed, there are no markets when there is anarchy because we're too busy killing each other and fighting over stuff. We have negated the idea that human interaction should be truly voluntary by advocating for, for anarchy. And the idea of anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. Capitalism requires government because it requires an agency that protects individual rights. And if you don't like the word government, that's fine. We can use a different word. We can use, I don't know, a Greek word or whatever. I don't care. I don't care about the word. What matters is the institution. There has to be an institution. Not all institutions. When we are free of for-profit trading institutions, all kinds of institutions, and one of those institutions' job is to make sure that people are not violent against each other, not committing fraud against each other, and that arbitrates disputes between us so we don't have to go into the street and duel it out, or that our agencies don't duel it out. And at the end, practically, I think anarchism always leads to authoritarianism. I think it always, the guy with the biggest gun, since you've legitimized guns as means of exchange, the guy with the biggest gun wins because he takes over all the other guys with the smaller guns and he dominates and controls. So I wish, I wish, I'm not going to get my wish, that uh, anarchy was excluded from the ideas that we typically call liberty and freedom ideas, but I'm in the minority. You anarchists are, are, are more than I am. So, but yeah, that, that's basic an outline of my views. If you want a fuller explanation, I actually did a debate on this topic with a uh, so-called anarcho-capitalist uh, in Poland a few months ago. It's on my YouTube channel generally. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, and that particular debate is on my YouTube channel, and you can see it there if you're interested in more discussion about this issue. Um, next question. My name is Emil Yusipo, and uh, I want to ask uh, to you, what do you think is the right way to uh, build a proper government which protects individual rights, which protects the free market, uh, so as not to allow it to drop into a bureaucratic machine, you know, and what? Like what's happened? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So what kind of government should we have to prevent it from going? So first, let me say this. There's no way to prevent it from going if that's what people want. So the be so uh, Benjamin Franklin, when he exited the, the Constitutional Convention where they were writing the Constitution of America, somebody came up to him and said, what kind of government have you given us? And he said, a republic, comma, if you can keep it. So it's our responsibility to hold them accountable for living up to the kind of government we have established. And every generation has to recommit themselves to liberty and recommit themselves to the fight for liberty in order to keep them this, the, 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 the Goliath from being established. But there are ways in which you could slow the process down or at least make it very, very hard for them. For example, the American Constitution has been pretty damn good, right? So even though America today is dramatically in decline, the Constitution has kept it mostly free, and I hesitate, but mostly free, for 200 years. That's pretty good. Now, I would rewrite the American Constitution. When Americans hear me say this, they all go, oh, you can't touch it, it's like the Bible. But no, I would rewrite it. And I would have four separations of state from in order to ensure that the state never grew. First, I would have the separation of state from ideas. You might call it state from church, but I consider church just being one set of ideas and it should be many ideas. The state has no opinion about what is right and what is wrong, ideas-wise. It isn't communist, capitalist, socialist, or anything. It protects individual rights based on the idea of the sanctity of the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. 
That's based on ideas, but it doesn't quibble about the ideas. It just follows that. Right? Second, a complete, thorough separation of the state from economics. The state doesn't have an economic czar or an economic minister or a treasury. It doesn't have any function. There's no central bank. There are no regulations. The state has no business in the economy. All it does is, if rights are being violated, or rights are about to be violated, if there's a real risk to rights, then it intervenes. But it cannot preempt. It cannot violate the rights of businessmen, of employees, of employers, to negotiate salaries, to negotiate anything. That should be left in the voluntary markets among us. Third, the state should be separated completely from education. There should be no state schools. There should be no public education or government schools. There should be no, again, government ideas to teach. If they get the schools, they have your kids' minds, they get to control everything in the end. The most important thing in the world is education. And if you give it to the government, forget it. Plus, what happens to the quality of it? I always ask people, what do you think this iPhone would look like if a government committee in Russia or America or anywhere designed it. Now, everybody laughs because it would look like a joke. But we're quite happy to let the government design what goes into our kids' brains. We're quite happy for them to design our educational system. We're quite happy for them to design our healthcare system. So no government interference in education. And fourth, this is a new one, uh, but I think as important these days, no complete government separation between state and science. No government funding for science. No government opinion about science. No government opinion about the temperatures of the globe 20 years from now or not, one way or the other. It's none of government's business. What is true science and what is false science, that is determined by scientists, not by government. So if you had those four separations, you'd be pretty free. You'd be free. And I think you could hold on to that freedom because it would be clear what we meant in that constitution by, by the role of government. And you would have to define individual rights and articulate what that means. Do you know me? Uh, well, my name is Alexander. Uh, thanks for the introduction. It's interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, you said that you believe that the duration society causes cost industrial revolution. Uh, then why it happened in why what? Then why industrial revolution <coughs> happens in the United Kingdom but not branch or United States of America. And uh, second, don't you think that uh, the idea of uh, equality equality of outcome that's a stupid idea I think we all care for it. Uh, it logically comes after uh, the idea of equality of opportunity. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Yes. Okay, let me try to answer those two questions. One is, why did the Industrial Revolution happen in the United Kingdom? I think because that was the country that was freest. It wasn't free, but it was freest. That is, by the time of the beginning of the 19th or, or the end of the 18th century, uh, the role of the king had been diminished and the role of Parliament, which is a much freer institution, had been realized. The, the, the recognition of property rights was very, very strong in the UK, going back to the Magna Carta and to the civil, civil legal system, um, where you would arbitrate disputes and you could sue people if they caused you damages. There was a tradition already built into the UK of respect for rights and respect for property that have evolved, why it evolved exactly there is hard to tell, but it evolved starting with the Magna Carta and on. And then finally, the United Kingdom is where the Enlightenment's most important thinkers lived, wrote, taught, spoke. You know, John Locke is there, Newton is there, ultimately Adam Smith is there, and in between all these Scottish thinkers, amazing thinkers who talk about liberty and freedom. And, and that was true in France to some extent. But in France, the king was everything. The king was the sun. You know, the king was still imbued with 
holy, a holy spirit, right? In America, in, in England already, the king was not that important. So I think that's why it happened in the UK. And of course, it really happened. Where it happened the fastest is in the United States of America, where you didn't have a king and you really had a freedom. And that's where the Industrial Revolution completely took off and, and overtook everybody else. By 1914, the United States was the largest economy in the world, the richest country in the world, and so on. Uh, what was the second question? Uh, Equality. Look, this is a long talk. I have a book. Here's another plug. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and buy my book. I'm a capitalist, right? I've got, a, I've got a book called Equal. I think you'll like the title. Equal is unfair. Right? Because I think fairness, justice requires inequality. We produce different amounts, therefore justice requires that we get different amounts. Um, I think the same is true of opportunity. There is no such thing as equality of opportunity. The fact is we all have different opportunities. The only sense in which equality means anything is equality of rights, equality of freedom, equality of before the law. So you all have a right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. All of you, every single one of you. Now the founders of America didn't believe that, unfortunately, because in spite of, in spite of writing, all men are created equal, there were slaves and there were not slaves. But the Declaration of Independence is the idea that there are, should never be slaves. They were all equal in terms of our freedoms, in terms of our rights. That's the only sense in which equality means anything and can be actually practiced. Sorry, are you an atheist? Am I an atheist? Absolutely. Since the age of six. That was not Iron Man. Everything else is Iron Man. Atheism, I did by myself. Only thing I did by myself.